I wonder how many people I've looked at all my life and never seen. I put that uh, little quote up there because as a kid, I felt uh, very disconnected. I felt um, very depressed. I felt no real sense of purpose. And to be quite honest, I didn't feel seen at all. And on my journeys around the world, I've realized, sometimes people ask me in the question and answer session, they say to me, what's the one, I'm gonna preempt the question, <laughs> what's the one thing that you learnt from your journeys around the world? And the one thing that I learnt, I learnt many things, but the one thing I most certainly learnt was that we are all the same. It does not matter where you're from, what colour you are, how much money you have, it doesn't matter. Ultimately, every single one of us wants one thing. And that's truly just to feel seen, to feel like we belong somewhere. Um, I find this specifically in kids, because kids don't have a filter, and adults have put on a mask, so it's harder to kind of penetrate through what an adult really wants. But we all, we ultimately we're all big kids. So that's the reason why I start my speech with this little quote, because I know that there are many, many people in my life who I have not seen. Um, and it's not a pleasant place to be when you feel alone, when you feel disconnected, yet it's an easy thing to remedy in a, in a, in a, with small steps, and that's simply just to reach out your hand and be of service to someone. And that could be a smile, that could be something big, but it starts with something small. Who has a smartphone? Who has a dumb phone? I have a smartphone and a dumb phone. Um, I'm using my dumb phone to time. Um, you know, we're all very connected, right? Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, everything. Always on the phone, always connected. Yet I tend to feel that ultimately we are at a stage in our evolution, let's say, where we are the least connected that we have ever been. Because the simple act of two human beings being present for each other, which has been going on for hundreds of thousands of years, or however many years it has been, has kind of been taken over now by phones. Like, I don't know if, if you guys, I'm sure you, some of you have kids or grandkids, they are obsessed with their phones. There is no real sense of human interaction unless the phone is physically taken away from them. Um, and that's a pretty, to me anyway, I don't have kids, but to me that's a pretty scary thing, pretty pl scary place to be because uh, human connection has a true healing power. Um, and when we lose that ability to connect, ultimately we are losing our own humanity. And that's a pretty scary place. I don't want to live in, well, I don't want to say that, but I would rather not live in a world where we are not connected. So ultimately, what, how is it that I, I'm here standing in front of you today? I used to be a broker in the city of London. On the outside, pretty much had everything you could want. On the inside, pretty much had nothing you could want. Yet I had a very, very good mask where no one could see what was really going on inside me. Is that vodka or water? Or oh, uzo? We can provide vodka. It's okay. <laughs> Water's fine. We all have this uh, mask and the, the longer we go without sharing our pain, and sharing our truth, the thicker that mask becomes and the harder it is to get rid of that mask. And I was sitting behind this desk, crunching numbers, doing what uh, other people wanted me to do. And I was dying inside, um, spiritually totally bankrupt 
emotionally on the cusp of bankruptcy. And I ended up very randomly, it's amazing how random things can shift a life. I ended up very randomly watching the movie, The Motorcycle Diaries. Has anyone seen that movie? Yeah. Okay, for those of you who haven't, it's a romanticized version of Che Guevara traveling around South America, relying entirely on the kindness of strangers. And there was something in that movie that kind of touched a deep place in my heart. It was like, even though it was a movie and it was maybe fantasy, whatever you want to call it, I saw that there was a way to live that was way beyond the way I was living. And I saw that if this guy can do this, and then why can't I do it? If I have this feeling when I'm watching this movie, then why can't I have this feeling when I'm out there in the world? Surely I can. So I remember like six months prior to that, I had had a moment where I'd woken up and I'd, I was in such a bad place. And I, I thought to myself, this is it. This is it. I am going to live the rest of my life totally uninspired, totally depressed, no sense of direction whatsoever. That's it. And in that moment, I'd kind of like given up. I, like, I was, I don't know, I was in my mid-twenties mid and I'd already given up. I was like, this is not good. <laughs> Again, on the outside, everything, inside, nothing. That day went by and I woke up the next morning and I made a commitment to myself. I was like, no, uh, under no circumstances are you going to give up. You're going to keep going and you're going to find a way to live the life you want to live. And the spark that lit the fuse, if that's the right way of putting it, was the Motorcycle Diaries. So I watched that movie, had an epiphany, quit my job and decided that I was going to start traveling around the world relying on the kindness of strangers. This is a, uh, it's, part of the, it's part of the movie and I, and I have this slide up here because I just kind of explained how I felt but sometimes it helps when you see this picture because these guys, to me anyway, the way I see, what I see here is joy, is connection, is adventure, is being, it's all the things that I didn't have. Freedom. I actually have a very unfortunate tattoo. Freedom, it says freedom, which is good, but it's in an unfortunate place, which I actually, I forgot I was being filmed. Forgot I was being filmed. Okay. Um, now everyone knows. Um, so yeah, freedom. And that's what I felt. And I was like, if, he, if, I can, if these guys can have it, then so can I. If I can have it, then so can you. If you can have it, then so can they. It's like a chain reaction. And it kind of just inspired me to go out and truly try at least, try to live as beautifully as I could. Again, there are always ups and downs and you'll hear some of the ups and some of the downs. So my first adventure was I was gonna walk from Times Square to the Hollywood sign on $5 a day. So I'd have no, only $5, I'd have to rely entirely on you. And I took away all my money on purpose, because if I have money in my pocket, the chances are I will not connect with you. If you take away my money, yes, in a social experiment kind of way, but if you take away my money, I am forced to connect with you. And by forcing myself to connect with you, I was forcing my heart to open to yours. And that's the first journey I did. I ended up in Los Angeles. Um, and, you know, sometimes change doesn't just happen like that. It just happens like that. And for me, it happened like that. I ended up working behind a desk again in LA, not doing the same job, but doing something that I wasn't very inspired by for quite a few years. And then I walked, uh, again, something random. I walked uh, down the street in Hollywood, Hollywood Boulevard, and I saw this chap with a, a sign that said, kindness is the best medicine. Something about that sign. Kindness is the best medicine. And I was like, whoa. It touched me, 
I, I helped the guy out a little bit and I went back to my house and for some reason on the way, my house isn't too far, 20 minutes, but if there's traffic, half an hour, for some reason on the way back to my house, I concocted this crazy plan. <laughs> this crazy plan. Even to this day, I'm, I think to myself, what? So I concocted this like really nutty idea that I was going to buy a vintage yellow motorbike. I was going to make it have a sidecar. I was going to drive it around the world, relying on the kindness of strangers. But I was going to do it with a twist because kindness is the best medicine. And the twist was that unsuspecting Good Samaritans would receive a life changing gift. Not every unsuspecting Good Samaritan, because otherwise I'd bankrupt myself, but certain Good Samaritans. And I went to my, to my girlfriend and I, and, I, and I told her this. I told her, I'm going to go away for six months. And I thought she'd be really happy because I was living my dream. <laughs> but she wasn't. And uh, a couple of months ago, actually, I was sitting down with someone, with a lady friend of mine, and she said to me, she said, uh, an, older, an older woman, she said to me, she said, Leon, you don't understand women very well, do you? And I'm like, evidently not. Because I swear, I was in shock. I was like, what? If you wanted to live your dream, I'd say, go. Maybe if she said she was going for six months, I wouldn't, but anyway. Um, so I, I sorted that little scenario out, and the rules were simple. No money, no gas, no food, no place to stay, nothing. Simply relying on the kindness of strangers. Um, I would have to pay for my visas, because you can imagine arriving in Turkey without a visa. Can you let me in for free? That's not going to happen. Um, and I had to pay for the, the bike, had a passport, had to pay for that. And I also had to pay, didn't have to pay for this, but I had to find a ship to cross the oceans. And um, I managed to do that. But basically, a simple idea and a lot of denial. Because the truth is, if I'd thought about what I was going to do, I wouldn't have done it. Because sometimes it's easy to, m to manipulate ourselves with our mind. Don't do this because of this and this and this. And you put so many barriers in front of you that by the time you even think about doing it, you just like, I can't do it. So I was in total denial uh, until day one. But I'm now going to introduce you to a man who really epitomizes why I did what I did. I was in... Uh, Pittsburgh in Pennsylvania trying to find a place to stay no one would help me which there's no expectation if you don't want to help me I understand that why would you help me and I went up to this chap and I said to him can I stay in your house tonight which is what I was doing for the past three hours and everyone was saying no I wonder why and um, he looked at me and he said look I'm really sorry but I'm homeless so I was like okay I felt some shame because in this moment I knew I was doing a social experiment and at home I had a girlfriend, a crazy dog, a house and whatever I needed on the outside. And this chap had nothing in reality, in life, nothing, literally nothing, not literally but pretty literally. Um, and he said to me then, he, he said something pretty extraordinary, he said, if you want tonight you can stay with me. I will feed you, I will give you some clothes, and I will protect you. And I was like, whoa, do I really want to stay on the streets of Pittsburgh with someone I don't even know? My mind was like, don't do it. But my heart and my intuition was like, do it. So I overruled my mind, and I did it. And he taught me, he did everything he said he would do. And he taught me the most powerful lesson I've, I've had the honor of learning. That is that true wealth is not in our wallets, but it is in our hearts. That doesn't mean that money is not important, because money is important. But here was a man that had nothing on the outside. But he had everything on the inside. I have met many, many penniless millionaires before. And then I have met people like Tony, someone who's 
generosity of spirit just keeps them, keeps them afloat, keeps them alive. I mean, how many times a day does, do people walk past Tony, myself included? We walk past homeless people as if they don't exist. We don't see them at all. And for 10 years, this is what this chap has had to deal with. And many, many millions more people around America and around the world. So that's me sleeping on the streets of Pittsburgh, which in the morning I said to Tony, I said, Tony, did you sleep well? And he looks at me and he says, no, I didn't. And I was like, why? Why didn't you sleep well? And he's like, well, I kept on waking up to take the bugs off you. And I was like, okay. Remember the Good Samaritan part? The unsuspecting Good Samaritan part? Well, this is where we get to now. So I said to Tony, I said, Tony, I want you to take me somewhere where you felt loved. And he has to think about it. And he's like, well, I felt loved at school. I was like, okay. So I took him for a little ride, a joy ride in Kindness One. And I took him to the school. The school was just, that's the picture, the school was just there. And I, I sit him down and I, I share with him the truth. And I say, you know how I told you I was traveling around the world relying on kindness? He's like, yeah. Well, that's true, but not all the truth. And I was able to um, put him up in an apartment and send him back to school to become a chef. His brother was a chef and he always wanted to be a chef. And Tony, we still stay in touch. And Tony uh, sometimes says to me, he says to me, Leon, you changed my life. And I say to him, Tony, what you don't understand, my friend, is that you changed my life. And that's the power of human connection. That's the healing power. Yes, I may have helped him, but he helped me truly far more than I helped him. I tell you, I wouldn't be doing speeches in front of kids right now. I wouldn't be doing speeches in front of you if it wasn't for him. If it wasn't for him opening up my heart to, to like, to come from a place of, instead of seeing with my eyes, to see with my heart. And he taught me how to do that. Just one random, I'd say what? I knew, I met him for like 13, 14 hours, yeah? Just one little random meeting can change, can change people imme immeasurably. When I see you, my heart smiles. I actually pretty much just have this because I like it. There's no real reason behind this slide. Um, I guess there is. I mean, I guess it's when you feel truly held by someone, not necessarily physically. It is, it is a very, very powerful thing. It's a very powerful place. It's a very powerful experience. Um, I, I've been on this journey. I've been traveling now for about three months. Not on this specific speech journey. I've been on a speech journey for like a, three weeks. This is what, speech number 33 or something. Ridiculous. It's a long trip. <laughs> um, what's I going to say? I haven't been watching TV for three months. And yesterday, for the first time, I watched a bit of TV. And I was like, wow, it's truly poison. <laughs> truly. Like, what we allow into our houses is pretty much poison. Um, amazing advertisements that are truly inspiring about Pepsi Cola drinks. Amazing, like, things that, that if we, the news magnifies the negative to such a degree. Don't get me wrong, there are bad things that happen. Definitely, I've seen them with my own eyes, I've felt them, and I'm sure you guys have as well. But come on, guys. The world is not a, as catastrophic as CNN, Fox, MSNBC make it out to be. That, it's like there is so much goodness out there. Yes, there's badness as well. Yes, it's, you know, definitely. But more often than not, it is the good that makes this world go round. Yet we all wake up in the morning, we, not all of us, but some of us turn on CNN and that's it. It's all, it's all terrible stuff. Um, there's so much more to, to life than, than, than that. Okay, who's been to Vietnam? Oh, cool. Where? Oh, so you went to Ho Chi Minh. Okay. 
Did you go to the Mokbai border? Uh, is that where that church is with all the religions? No, it's the land border between Cambodia and Vietnam. Yeah? Oh, yeah. It's yeah. yeah, okay. So I was at the Mokbai border. Um, I remember I told you about my uh, little passport, my bike passport. Well, to cut a long story short, the Vietnamese did not like my bike. And uh, they were not going to let my bike in. And it was a whole hullabaloo. Uh, but I share this story, I'm sharing a shortened version of it, but I'm sharing this story because ultimately I was helped by the Americans. I went to the American embassy. You may say, why did you... So you've got to be careful because I'm being filmed. So I went to the American embassy and um, I remember thinking to myself that if I tell the Americans what has happened and the fact that they will not give me the bike for whatever logistical reason, they will help me. And that's exactly what they did. I had traveled, I don't know how many thousands of miles. I was on the verge of not getting my bike back. And the American embassy helped me get my bike back. Um, and I've traveled across America many, many times. And I've been inspired by the generosity of spirit. There's a reason why people want to come to America. Um, and one of those reasons is the people. And the way of life. Um, and the kindness. Um, it, it, it's a... It was truly an amazing thing. I wouldn't have, the bike would never have got out if it wasn't for the Americans. So I ended up meeting this lady over a bowl of noodles uh, in Vietnam. And uh, she said to me, I want, to, I want to introduce you to someone really special. So I was like, okay. And I literally ended up meeting this doctor who was a really, really powerful powerful human being. Who knows someone or has had themselves cataract surgery? Okay, one, two of us. <laughs> um, this guy dedicates his whole life every single day, that's a lie, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, <laughs> to giving free eyesight surgery to poor Vietnamese farmers. And um, what's quite amazing is that to get free eyesight surgery in Vietnam costs, well obviously it's free, but <laughs> for the doctor it's $30. $30. So most of these people, in fact all of these people, and thousands more would stay blind if it wasn't for the, a doctor like that. And I sometimes say to the kids when I give the speech, it's a little bit different, but I say to the kids, I say, do you know LeBron James? And they're like, yeah. Do you know Taylor Swift? And they're like, yeah. And we talk about how, you know, these kind of people are, are, are heroes in some way. And I tell them, the true heroes are your teachers. The true heroes are doctors like that, who dedicate their life to helping other people. Those are the true heroes. So I was at the, um, I was standing outside, sitting outside this beautiful building in Ho Chi Minh City. I had no idea what it was. And I was having a melodramatic moment, which I have often, uh, because my bike was being impounded. And a guy comes out from the doors and he says, are you okay? And I'm like, yeah, I'm okay, I'm just having a moment. And he said, well, if you like, tonight, come to the opera. And I was like, come to the opera, okay. Who ever gets invited to the opera when you're in Vietnam, just sitting randomly? So I do, I go that night. He sends me to the top of the bleachers, whatever you want to call them. And he comes 10 minutes before the end, he taps me on the shoulder. And he says, I want you to go in the show. I was, I was like, what? You want me to go in the show? He's like, yeah. I was like, all right. So he gives me these drums, and I'm going to show you a video after this and you'll see it. He gives me these drums. And he says, go out there and play your heart out. And I was like, I can do that. I said, I'm not very good. He's like, don't worry about it. I know. <laughs> um, and the reason why I've got this little slide is because it was in that moment, after I finished playing my heart out, 
and after I had got this standing ovation, not because I was good, because I was the only white guy on stage and they knew something odd was going on <laughs> and they knew how bad I was. Um, and in that moment, I, fe I felt seen and I thought back to Tony and I realized that Tony, one of the gifts I had given him was simply to see him. And one of the gifts these people were giving me in this moment was to see me and it all came full circle. And what I said at the beginning was that the most powerful thing and what we all ultimately want is to be seen. I figured that out on that stage in Ho Chi Minh City. So I want to show you guys a little uh, video. So to me, the most important thing that I learned, apart from the fact that we all want to be seen, is that every single one of us can affect change in a positive way. Or we can choose to affect change in a negative way. It's really up to us how we do that. And took me sleeping on the streets of Pittsburgh to figure that one out. I hope it doesn't take that for you, but for me that's what it took. Thanks, and now I'm going to open it up to any questions you may have.